we left off last time with uh, solving string matching with suffix trees, but we've already knew, we already knew a solution for that. So now let's look at a new problem. And this is one step in between to this problem I took as motivation initially, this longest common, pre common uh, substring problem. And this is the longest repeated substring, slightly different. Um, here we have a, a, a single text. And in this text, we try to find some part, some, some substring that occurs at least twice. So uh, there's a substring in the text starting at position i of length l. And there's a second occurrence, so another starting index j, where this also occurs. OK? The definition allows that these two overlap. That's fine. Uh, you can define variants where this is not allowed, but here we, we, uh, we are happy with that. So in a way, this, the a, a trivial brute force algorithm could just try for every i, you could try every j, and then see how long you can read. Uh, that sounds like it could even go cubic. It's very slow. Uh, and it seems that we have to at least check all possible substrings. You can do better than cubic if you check all start and end indices and check if they occur another time in the string. That's essentially string matching in disguise, so we could, could solve that. So quadratic time is, is easily doable and is still somewhat trivial, but that's still way too slow. I'm still not happy with that. All of these simple solutions seem to rely on checking every possible substring of a text, every start and end position, explicitly. And as long as we're doing that, we're too slow. We have to uh, spend quadratic time to do that. But it turns out with a suffix tree, we can avoid that. And the reason is that we don't really care about all substrings. All we care about are the repeated strings anyways. So there are, in a sense, many substrings where we can easily exclude them as not being interesting because they only occur once. And to motivate why the suffix tree helps, look at the example here from, from the small um, text that we had last time. It's, it's a small example, so uh, the overlap is only small. Um, but maybe you can uh, imagine how this generalizes. So in this, in this word banana ban, um, we have two parts, a ban and an, that's two suffixes. And they both start with a, they have a common prefix. So two suffixes, and start somewhere in the word, go to, until the end. If they have a common prefix, that's a repeated string because it occurs at the beginning of two suffixes. So it occurs at two positions. I maybe uh, draw this briefly. So I have two positions, i and j. The whole thing from here to the end, that's ti. And the whole thing from here to the end, that's tj. Now, if they, if they have a common prefix, that means there's a, a substring in the text that occurs twice. Because I could put tj again here, and then I would have matches in some, some prefix here where these characters are the same. OK, fine. But what does that mean in the suffix tree? Uh, because the suffix tree is a try of all the suffixes, there must be a path for these two suffixes as well. Namely, there's the path going to 5, and there's the path going to 7. It's the starting indices. Now, in these two paths, they are starting at the same, at the same node, namely the root, and then they end somewhere different. So at some point, they branch out from each other. So they have this shared segment here, and then they differ. And that shared segment is exactly the longest common prefix, because that's the part of the string that they share, where they are the same. And uh, in this case, um, it means the suffix tree has to have such an internal node, because if they uh, have a shared path and then they branch out, they have to branch out at something, and that's always a node. So there's an internal node. Um, that you reach with this with this common uh, sub with this common prefix. Now the thing is also true in reverse. Any uh, internal node in the suffix tree 
is also the common prefix of two, at least two suffixes, namely some leaf that is where the paths split at this node. If there were none of those, if all the leaves were in the same child, remember it's a, it's a compact tri, so then this would have been eliminated. Uh, all our nodes have at least two children. Why does that help us? Well, we've, thought, we've, we've analyzed this earlier. The number of internal nodes in the suffix tree is at most linear. It's at most the number of suffixes. And so I only have a linear number of, long, of longest common prefixes to check at most. So even though there are many more, sub, many more substrings in the text, if I restrict myself to the repeated parts, there's only a linear number of them that are candidates for being the longest, this longest repeated substring. In a way, that's the magic of the suffix tree, that it nicely uh, narrows down this list of candidates for us. All right. So uh, to put that on the slides, what we, what we discussed, the longest repeated substring in the text always has to be also the longest common prefix of two suffixes. I don't know which ones, but there's, there's uh, two indices so that this is uh, the longest common prefix. Um, and so as an algorithm to find the longest repeated substring is compute the suffix tree. There it is takes linear time by the black box construction that we haven't shown yet, but you can take my word for it. Then we compute what's called the string depth of all the nodes. And uh, that's something that'll come up. So um, let me highlight that. And let's do it also here on, on our example. It's nothing but the length of the string that leads you to this internal node. So it's just reading along. Here I have one character read, so I have string depth one. The root always has string depth zero. Here is also one, but here is three because I have three things on the edge going down there. There's two and three, and here's uh, another two. Okay. Now systematically computing those would be uh, a search from the root. You have a recursive algorithm, if you say a recursive function that starts at the root, remembers how deep it currently is. And whenever you branch down, you just increment that depth by whatever, how long the, the edge label is. Um, that's computing the string depths. So you do one traversal of the tree that's linear in the size of the tree. So it's linear time in the length of the text as well. The second step is among all those nodes, we have to find one that has a longest shared path, so it has maximal string depth. And that's also easy. You just traverse the tree a second time and keep track of the maximal number you ever see as, as string depth. So the maximal string depth in our example is, is not unique. There's two places. Uh, these two nodes both have string depth three. And uh, so they correspond to the string span or Anna. And both of those occur twice in our text. And you can check this, right? Ban is here and here. And Anna is a bit more interesting. Anna is here and here. So this is an overlapping occurrence where it, it shares the A in the middle. As I said, that's OK. That's allowed. Uh, if you wanted to disallow those, then um, you have to modify the algorithm a bit. But we'll, we'll keep it with this straightforward version. So we all will have a linear time algorithm. As long as we can construct the suffix tree first, the rest is all uh, done in linear time. Now this problem already feels somewhat similar to um, the motivational problem. A repeated substring in one large text is similar to having this common substring in several texts. It's not exactly the same, but at least uh, you can maybe uh, see that there's some, some similarity. Uh, so maybe you can hope that a similar trick works. And um, if you start thinking about this, 
maybe you could just take the texts in isolation and build the suffix tree for each. Uh, but if you, if you play with this a bit, you kind of uh, don't see that going anywhere. Um, instead, what we seem to need is somehow uh, a single suffix tree that covers all the texts. And to motivate that, let me go back briefly again. So this, this correspondence that an internal node corresponds to a repeated string, right? That was because there were two paths going to different leaves that are shared until this point and then they branch off. Um, if I want to find common substrings in different texts, then I also need this kind of shared path and then branching off into different strings. And uh, for that, we somehow need something that puts, puts all the texts in one big tree. But it's maybe not so clear how to do that without losing the information where things come from. And so that's a, a second little uh, concept. It's actually a simple trick that works. Um, but I think it's, it's very useful to, um, to see, have this one in mind. Uh, you can define a generalized suffix tree that works for several texts. And conceptually, um, it, it can be thought of as just the suffix tree for the text where you concatenate all the texts. If you also um, have special markers in between that tell you where each, each of the original strings ends. Uh, if, you don't, if you don't do that, then uh, a few things um, break. Uh, but uh, it's easy to add these extra special markers, uh, a different marker for each string. And then you can use the construction for a standard suffix tree as a black box. It doesn't need to be modified. Um, the reason for these, for these dollars is that if you take a suffix of all the, of this, of this uh, concatenation of all the strings, uh, they can be of different length, that's fine. So here's, here's my dollar one, dollar two, dollar three, and so on. Because these are all new symbols that don't occur anywhere else, if I take any suffix of this, say this one, okay, don't want to run into the car. Uh, if I take any suffix like this, every suffix of this long text will have a leaf in the suffix tree, in T. Uh, the, the curly T. So there will be a leaf corresponding to this suffix. Now, because all these dollar symbols are, uh, are different, there's no way that this dollar two symbol occurs in any other part in the text. So this leaf will be a branch on its own. At the very latest, when this dollar two comes along, it's an edge that is, that is only once there and you will never have um, Anything, anything else occurring there. Uh, there's no, no way to have that shared. Um, so these, these dollar edges always lead to a leaf. That's, um, that's what, this here, uh, what this here says. And that means conceptually I can, I can ignore that this suffix contains a copy of all the later texts. As soon as I have a unique leaf here, I could say, that leaf corresponds to the chafe text and the ith position in that text. So it's a little bit of doing arithmetic back and forth from the coordinates in the global text to the local text, but you just subtract all the lengths of those before it. Um, we'll see an example in a second, but in a way, uh, what you should take from this slide is uh, there's a simple way to generalize the suffix tree. So that the same is true as before. We have a compact try of the suffixes of all the texts in the, in the tree. And uh, now the leaves don't just tell me where the suffix starts, but they also tell me which of the texts it was. That's what I conceptually want from this generalized suffix tree. Um, and algorithmically, it, it works by just doing a standard suffix tree on this, on this artificial text, concatenating everything with special symbols in between. Uh, before I move on to the example, 
Time to wake you up with a little question. This one's not a trick question. It's just about being sure that we have the, the same uh, definition in mind. And then you also know uh, what the answer should be when we look at the uh, example. I almost have our 50 people together. By the time I switch, I guess we have it. Um, yeah, a vast majority is the same opinion. It's always these, these word pictures make it look like, oh, there's a few people put BCA, but it's actually 50 votes for BCA. And that's, that's of course, also the right answer. Um, because this last string is so short, there's really not much, uh, not much else we can do unless we can fit the entire string of length four into the others, which we cannot. Uh, the longest sh common substring can have length three, right? And so, because BCA occurs in all three, uh, in the first um, even twice, that's that's the answer. Now. How can we find this algorithmically? Uh, it is similar to the longest repeated string, but uh, there are two changes. One is we have to use the generalized suffix tree because we have different texts. And the second is we're not happy if the text just occurs twice anywhere. It should somehow occur so that it occurs in each of the texts. That's a second constraint. And uh, we can check both of these. So the algorithm works as follows. It, it computes the generalized suffix tree for our collection of, uh, of texts. Then um, we, uh, we compute the string depths uh, in the second step, same as before. Another thing we compute is um, the subset of texts that have a leaf below a certain internal node. So uh, here's how to do this in a bottom-up traversal, but just to explain what this, this label, this annotation should mean, every internal node or every node in general has a set of indices of texts so that there's some way to run through that node with um, a, a suffix of that text, which also means the path from the root to that node occurs in that text. And you, you just compute for every node which texts does that uh, occur in. I'll show an example, and I guess it's, uh, it's much clearer. Uh, but let's first look at the running time. So this here is, um, this is order n for the size of the generalized text. But the size of the generalized text is just a, the text is the concatenation, so the size is the sum of the sizes. Uh, I guess plus k, but uh, we assume that the texts are not empty, so in terms of big O, that's the same. For that second step, if we look at how it is implemented as a traversal, you can do a bottom-up traversal. This is, again, uh, we haven't discussed um, depth first search and tree traversal in detail in this module, but uh, you'll, you'll either do it next year or you've done it in the Python module. Um, so you, there's a recursive function, you start at the root and then you recurse to all children. And bottom-up traversal means you do something after, um, you do something uh, coming back. So when you reach a leaf, you know this because you don't recurse further. Um, then if you have a leaf, 
Ji meant its starting position i in text Tj. And so we just put the singleton set J, a leaf of that type corresponds to just text the text J. If I come back up from the recursion and I have computed those sets for all my children, I can now compute the set for myself for this internal node by taking the union of all those sets. And if you do this in that way as a recursive procedure, it's time is linear in the number of nodes in the suffix tree, and that's again uh, overall order n time because we have order n uh, nodes in the suffix tree. The computation of the string depths is like before, that hasn't changed. Um, it's just uh, using, using the generalized suffix tree, but it looks for that computation the same as, a, as an ordinary suffix tree. And the last step is also the same, except that we have to check this additional constraint. So we want to find a node that has largest string depth, the longest repeated thing, but we only include those internal nodes where we have the full set of all texts, where the set of indices of texts that have a leaf below them is the entire set one up to k. And here's, here's the promised example. It looks a bit wild maybe because uh, it's a larger, larger text. That's the generalized suffix tree for these three example strings. So you see, um, let's take example, for example, CA and then dollar two. There must be a, an, a path from, for this because it's a suffix of the second, second string. So if I go down with BC, uh, sorry, CA, C, a, and then dollar two brings me to this leaf, and that's that's the leaf that corresponds to that suffix. Um, and similarly, you can do it for all the others. Now I've uh, already put the string depth in the nodes, um, which, by the way, if you represent the suffix tree as a compact try, the numbers in the nodes that we knew that we need anyways for the try is also the string depth. I don't know if you made that connection already, but uh, they are really the same. So when the algorithm says compute the string depth, it actually doesn't have to do anything. Um, the representation of the suffix tree would already know that number. It's just on the human version that we didn't show them. The green numbers we still have to compute. So let's uh, look at an example there as well. Uh, for, com for completeness, every leaf would have a green number that corresponds to the dollar that is at, at its end. So this is a leaf that corresponds to a substring from, or a suffix from text two. This is a leaf that corresponds to a suffix from text one. That means this internal node corresponds to a repeated string. So A, B, C, A is a string that occurs in both text one and text two. Let's double check that. A, B, C, A, I can find that here and I can find that here, okay? It does not occur in text three. That's why this is only one and two and not also index three. Uh, another example, this one here, there's a leaf that corresponds to text three and two. So this corresponds to t, uh, two and three, but not one. And the path down here is AA. A. So indeed there's AA a in this and AA a in this text, but there's no repeated A in the first text. Okay, so you see how this, how this is going. The bottom-up traversal is then just annotate all the leaves and for every internal node take the union of the, of the sets at, it, at the children. Now from all, those, from all those nodes that really have all three, which are just these, we now have to pick the one with maximal string depth. And in this case that's clearly this one, it's the only one with three that is circled in blue. And that corresponds to the string BCA that you identified in the question before. Okay. Yeah, I wonder if starting with the example made, would have made this clearer. Maybe I'll swap it around. So let's wrap up. We, uh, we learned two things. Um, we learned there's a generalized suffix tree, so you can essentially treat it conceptually as having 
the same kind of structure as a normal one, but it also remembers the suffix of what text are we talking about. And you can get that for free. Second trick we learned, we can do some extra annotations in the tree. We can get the string depth of a node, so the number of characters on the path to that node. We can get that for free with the linear time extra preprocessing. And we can do things like this, find the set of all indices of texts that are below a certain, a certain node. We can also do that in a, in a linear time preprocessing. 